Friction is everywhere, especially on digital ecosystems. Successful marketplaces are enabling and accelerating interactions between multiple segments all over the world. The level of optimization of today's multi-sided platforms has reached a point where the winners will apply technology to remove as much friction from all interactions. You want to know more about friction? So stay tuned, because today we will explore how digital innovators can create frictionless experiences and boost the growth of platform business. Roger Dooley is a renowned author of neuroscience books such as Brainfluence, and recently he published an entire book about friction. Today, we will explore the untapped force of removing friction, especially from digital business and multi-sided platforms. Hello, Roger. How are you? I'm doing fine, Gustavo. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Thanks for being here. So, Roger, the first question uh, I want to ask you, um, I know that many people are familiar with this term, but uh, I've seen that uh, most uh, people not. What is, what is friction? Right, well, um, in the physical world, of course, it's a force that opposes motion. So uh, if a child uh, gets stuck halfway down a playground slide uh, because it's not slippery enough, uh, that's due to friction. Uh, but uh, my use of friction is um, unnecessary effort to complete or perform a task. So. Uh, when you go to, uh, say, check out of an e-commerce site, uh, if, it's, if it's a complicated process, if there's many steps, uh, that's much more friction than, say, Amazon's one-click checkout process, where all you do is click your mouse one time and you are checked out and that product will be on your doorstep within 48 hours. So uh, that's the context that I use friction in. Nice. And uh, tell me, Roger, why why people uh, struggle to see friction? You 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 also tell a story about uh, friction goggles. How does it work? Right. Uh, well, sure. yes. I actually I actually have um, friction friction goggles uh, here. These these are not uh, uh, real friction goggles, of course. Uh, but uh, what I found is people don't always see friction because they are either used to it, they're accustomed to it or because they don't think there's a different way. So I think a good example is the taxi industry, where for 50 years probably, uh, the taxi process was very little changed. Uh, there was a lot of friction in there. You know, you could call a taxi, didn't know where they, if they were going to show up or where they were. You had to explain to a driver, maybe with some language difficulties, what your destination was. Uh, then you had to pay at the end, and maybe there were some problems with credit cards and uh, or having the right currency if you're in a different country and uh, you know people just accepted that they didn't say wow this is a terrible process they said well that's it's taxi and that's the way it works and it wasn't until uber came along uh, and showed that there was a much easier way of doing it they took all that friction out and then once people saw that then they saw for what it was the, how bad the previous experience was and i think that same kind of thing exists in a lot of places we do things um, because uh, we've been doing them that way and we don't really envision a better way of doing it. And you know, I think that's the uh, advantage for uh, small companies is to uh, sort of put on those uh, metaphorical friction goggles, uh, see some friction that other people don't see, uh, and then eliminate it with their process. Yes, and, and the Uber example is a fantastic example because uh, they did not create taxis, mobile phones, mobile payment, GPS and maps. The only thing they did, they just took technology and put together and remove all the friction. So the major part of the value provided by Uber is by removing friction on something that already exists in the past. Yes, and, and also the fact that uh, they are a platform that brings together drivers and riders uh, in the same way that uh, before eBay, uh, trying to buy things uh, like uh, collectible items online was a very high friction process. You probably couldn't even find what you were looking for. If you did, you were dealing with an unknown seller in a different city. 
uh, and you would worry about sending them money uh, because you might not get what you paid for and so on. Uh, and eBay, by creating this platform, uh, made it very easy to find what you were looking for or made it also very easy to sell what you wanted to sell. And by uh, bringing uh, these two sides together in uh, a, uh, on a platform where they created trust with various guarantees, uh, that would eliminate a lot of the friction and in general, uh, trust is uh, sort of the uh, opposite of friction where there is low trust, there's high friction. Uh, that's why you may have uh, complicated processes for some things because neither party trusts the other one so they have to verify at each step uh, before they say pay an invoice, they've got to count everything, they've got to test its quality, they've got to do this and that to, uh, and expend a lot of effort where if there was an atmosphere of trust where if you trusted that supplier to simply deliver what they said they were going to deliver and the quality to be correct, uh, you could dispense with uh, all of that friction. So, um, you know, trust where if you can increase trust, you'll reduce friction. And that's one thing that eBay did. They increased uh, trust in buyers and sellers uh, by being that uh, sort of uh, trusted intermediary that was guaranteeing the transaction. Yes, uh, and we know that uh, the, the platform creators, especially the startups and uh, platform uh, managers, they are in the business of uh, facilitating interactions. So the greater the number of interactions in a platform, uh, more uh, the platform can grow. And we know that they do that by building audience, matchmaking those participants and the platform, uh, providing tools and services and creating rules and regulations. But I'm interested in those two first steps of, uh, of the platform um, and uh, those two first functions, which is uh, audience building and matchmaking uh, to bring people and make them interact on the platforms. Can you give a few examples about um, Amazon, uh, what, what they have done? You list, I guess, so many uh, nice things that Amazon, have, they, they discover with time that they could do to remove friction. Can you give us a little bit more of, uh, of those examples? Sure, and uh, you know, Amazon is a case study in friction reduction. Uh, that is part of their corporate ethos. Uh, way back in 1997, uh, when a lot of companies were just figuring out how to sell online, Jeff Bezos was talking about frictionless shopping. Uh, and the year after that, 1998, uh, they patented one-click ordering. And now when you think about it, uh, uh, one-click ordering, first of all, it didn't seem like a very significant invention. A lot of people didn't think it was even patentable, uh, but Amazon spent millions of dollars to defend that patent in court against challenges from Barnes and Noble and others. Uh, and they valued that one-click difference uh, you know, enough to invest in fighting and fighting, and actually, ultimately, they prevailed. All they succeeded in doing with that was forcing Barnes & Noble, which previously had implemented a similar one-click ordering system, to add a confirm order click. Uh, so, I mean, when you think about it, if we think about the processes in our own businesses, we would think of one mouse click as being inconsequential, not important at all. It's only one mouse click, who cares? Uh, but in fact, uh, Jeff Bezos cared enough to fight in court uh, to preserve that advantage. And if you, uh, uh, then Steve Jobs saw that uh, and he also saw the advantage in that he paid immediately a million dollars cash uh, to license one-click ordering so that he could put it in his brand new music store at the time. Uh, and, you know, when you get uh, smart people like Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos saying this one tiny little click is really important, you know, it doesn't seem like much of an advantage, uh, but it is, uh, you know that even the tiniest bit of extra effort uh, is going to hurt your uh, customer acquisition rate, your conversion rate, and so on. Uh, and I think uh, jumping over to a different example, uh, you've got uh, a WhatsApp where they are a platform, a communication platform, messaging platform, uh, and they were faced with, you know, how do we grow when there are many messaging apps out there? Uh, you, you know, the features aren't all that different in most cases. Uh, they perform those same functions. Uh, and what they did was they created a super simple onboarding process. Uh, 
uh, one user experience expert did sort of a teardown, like went through the onboarding process that they implemented, uh, and it had to, didn't have to set up a username, didn't have to set up a password. Uh, he found that he could do the entire thing uh, in about two minutes total. Uh, and that was including a verification code that they sent to the phone that you were registering from. Uh, and so within two minutes, you could be uh, online. And then they also provided a way to invite your friends because the messaging platform is no good if your friends aren't on there uh, or other people aren't on there. You know, what? you can have the best messaging app in the world, but if you're the only one using it, it is absolutely worthless. So um, it made it very, very easy to invite friends. And of course, then these friends had the exact same very, very fast onboarding process. And that's why WhatsApp grew like crazy and other competing apps just did not grow as quickly. And um, Facebook ended up spending billions and billions of dollars to acquire them because they saw how uh, difficult it would be to replicate what WhatsApp did and achieve that same level of user acceptance so quickly. And they said, okay, hey, uh, these guys did it right. We're just going to buy them. What about uh, online security? Um... Because if you if you promote friction, if you reduce friction, sorry, um, you you cannot uh, uh, in security wise you can be so safe. Uh, can you give the examples of the, the passwords? On the yeah, you know, uh, I think that first of all, online security is really important uh, because there is real fraud out there. There is identity theft. There are hackers that are trying to uh, steal your information and so on. So you. Uh, you cannot ignore that. No uh, website owner or app developer can ignore security. It's, it's important. There's no question. But uh, it's also important to uh, strike a balance with user experience. And uh, going back to Amazon, they are a great example of a company that uh, has what appears to be uh, very minimal security. Uh, I'm still using the same bad password that I set up 12 years ago on Amazon. They've never said, uh, you need to change it because we got hacked or they never said we noticed you have a weak password now we want one with uh, uh, you know two symbols and uh, uh, uppercase and lowercase and a couple of numbers and everything else uh, uh, and they always keep you logged in uh, I'm a frequent flyer on United Airlines I am constantly on their website and they drive me absolutely crazy because uh, after I don't know 15 minutes or something they automatically log me out and often if I'm doing travel arrangements I've got multiple windows open. I've got uh, maybe a few hotel sites open. I've got the conference website that I'm going to speak at and I'm looking at what the schedule is, uh, trying to plan my flights, my hotels, maybe a rent a car or something. I've got all this stuff going on. And so I come back to my flight window and I find that they've logged me out. Uh, you know, and it is, and I have to start back over again, searching for flights, finding the flight that I thought looked pretty good and actually booking it. Uh, where Amazon never logs you out. You know, I think you have to buy a new computer or reformat your hard drive to get logged out of Amazon. Uh, they know how important it is that every time you come to their website, uh, you are enabled to not only shop around and find products, but to click that uh, button that says uh, one click order. Uh, you know, if they had forced you to log in every time, they would get fewer sales because people would forget their login or they just wouldn't go through the effort of, of logging in. Uh, but uh, that does not mean that Amazon has no security. Uh, they have sort of a layered security process where uh, if I decide to ship to an address that I've never shipped to before, which could be, uh, I mean, I do that occasionally because I want to send somebody a, a book or something. Uh, but uh, when I do that, uh, they will ask me to re-authenticate in some way. Just maybe just re-log in with my uh, user ID and password. Or uh, if I want to send people gift cards which Amazon gift cards are basically as good as cash because you can buy anything on Amazon, uh, that would be a potentially risky behavior. If somebody hacked my account, what would they do? Uh, they would send other people gift cards. Uh, so uh, Amazon uh, will then ask me to re-enter my credit card number or re-authenticate in some way if I engage in this risky behavior. But for 99% of the things that I want to do on Amazon, they keep me logged in all the time and enable me to accomplish that place those one-click orders, shop around, add to my lists, uh, you know, all those things um, I can do without ever having to go through a reauthentication process. And that's because at some high level of management, 
Uh, I guess I would credit uh, Jeff Bezos, but uh, presumably uh, there is a management commitment uh, even uh, below him. Uh, somebody has said, okay, uh, yes, there is some small risk by not logging people out all the time or by not having a super secure password. But from a business standpoint, uh, we know that it's worth it to operate this way, where I think in other businesses, um, there's a um, perhaps a political vacuum at the top where uh, perhaps because of a, ha a previous hack, they've said, oh, security is really important. And now that security person is driving user experience. And I think one thing that is uh, really important for every company, whether they're a startup or whether they're a well-established company, is that uh, people who do not have customer experience in their job title should not be the ones determining what customer experience looks like. Uh, there has to be, uh, you know, you certainly do need security. Uh, you have to have accounting controls and all these things that are important functions. Compliance, if you're in a regulated industry, and actually every industry is regulated these days, you've got GDPR and you've got financial disclosures and things. Uh, uh, you have to meet these compliance things, but you should do that in a way that does not diminish the customer experience. I mean, I've seen sites in the financial industry where they have the same disclosure requirements as far as the risks involved in their products and so on. One uh, forces users to scroll past a whole bunch of large black text describing all the risks involved. Uh, and uh, that's very unfriendly and it's high friction. Uh, and it's, it might actually be scary to some people where a, another company might have that same information, but they'll try and word it as simply as possible they will put it in somewhat smaller type that's perfectly legible, but not in the customer's face. So the customer who wants to read it can find it. Uh, but uh, I mean, the two, the, both firms are compliant with the law, but one is doing so in a way that doesn't harm the customer experience and the other one is not. And what about uh, search engines? Uh, we know that uh, the platforms, they must uh, match make and so every pla platform nowadays, they have an internal Google inside. They have their own search engine. And that's the way it should be powered by AI and machine learning. What yes. can we learn with Google? Uh, to well, Google, yeah, Google is the um, uh, another uh, company that is focused on minimizing their customer effort, their user effort. Uh, uh, they have, since their very first day, uh, they made their interface much simpler than uh, their competition. Their competition at that point uh, was were people like Yahoo and Excite and Alta Vista, uh, who had these really complex portal pages. There was a little search box somewhere they had to hunt for, where Google just put a search box on a page. And that's pretty much what they do today. That hasn't changed that much over the years. The logo has changed a little bit, but not much else. Uh, they, uh, But over time, it keeps getting better and better. They. Uh, use smart suggestions. So, well, actually even before that now, if you go to google.com uh, using a web browser, uh, the cursor will be positioned in the search box. So you don't have to click. They saved one little click there. Where I go to many websites and there there is no focus on the page. If you want to search, you have to uh, click the search box. The uh, As soon as you type one character, uh, they are trying to guess what you want and as you just suggested, Gustavo, they're using AI machine learning from all their search experience to guess that if you type in W, maybe you want weather because a lot of people search for weather. Uh, and uh, so it could be that just by typing one character, you've already seen the choice you want. And then just by making that one selection with a mouse click or tap of your finger, uh, you will get to their results page. And even there, they minimize your effort. In the old days, what did search engines give you? They gave you a list of links. You would pick the link that looked best and you would click that link and then hopefully the page that you went to had what you wanted. Uh, but for many, many searches, now Google tries to give you the answer instantly. So if you do click weather, uh, they don't give you a list of weather sites. I mean, there are weather sites if you scroll down, but uh, right up at the top, they show you what your current uh, conditions are, where you're, you're located. They give you an hourly forecast for the rest of the day, a daily forecast for the rest of the week. So probably 98% of the searchers are satisfied by not having to click anything at all after that. It's just the, they see the Google results and they have the information that they need. So I mean, that's tremendous. Now, uh, 
uh, what I do see on uh, sites and in apps, just about everybody has some kind of a search function, whether it's a product search, it's a help search, it's um, on platforms, usually you have some kind of a matching search, uh, like you're trying to find a ride or, or something or a place to stay. Uh, the uh, it's important to try and emulate Google as much as possible and say, how can we eliminate every keystroke, every click? And uh, I recently did a comparison. I was doing some shopping for a home improvement product. Uh, I was looking for, uh, this is really strange, warm white puck lights, these little round disc lights that you use like in a kitchen counter lighting or something. Uh, and I searched uh, two different, well, three different websites. Uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, who are big home uh, product retailers, home improvement retailers, and then Amazon, who basically has everything. And what I found uh, when I searched at Lowe's, uh, I typed in warm white, and they, they tried to guess. They started giving me some stuff to click on, but it was for white towel warmers. So uh, that was not enough of a clue to help me uh, where at Home Depot, uh, they recognize that warm white is a specific term used in the lighting industry. And so probably of the 10 suggestions, probably seven or so were for lighting products. Uh, so, I mean, they, they did a much better job uh, at that point. Uh, uh, and uh, Amazon, uh, I got to warm. And for, however, I don't know how they knew that, but they started suggesting some lighting products as part of their suggestions. So, uh, you know, it's there was a, a very substantial difference uh, in there. And then in the search results themselves, once I typed in the entire search string at Lowe's, uh, these are the ones, who, who, the folks who are suggesting towel warmers, uh, of the top search results, uh, the top row was, were four products. Three of the four were not relevant. They were warm white Christmas lights, not puck lights. And there was, was no puck in the description. So uh, uh, that, those were not good search results. I would have to scroll and scroll to find what I was looking for. Uh, Home Depot uh, gave me relevant results at the top, but they appeared to be missing some. In other words, there were products that I thought based on their website should have been in that search, but for whatever reason didn't show up. Not sure why. Uh, Amazon, on the other hand, showed me both sponsored results from advertisers there and organic results. And every single one was for the type of product that I was looking for. So uh, if you looked at the effort that I would have to exert to find the right product, you could see the difference in the sites. and. Now that's true uh, regardless of whether you're trying to guide people say to a help topic on your site because people are often trying to figure out how to use your product or use your website or whatever uh you know you can uh i know i'm often frustrated by searching for something and i simply can't find what i'm looking for i know that it must be there someplace but i cannot use the right search terms where uh the way as in uh, business you try and uh, do it right is you look at what users are doing. I, I can't emphasize enough, Gustavo, how important it is to uh, look at your user or your customer's behavior, their real behavior. What are they searching? What are they typing in? When they type that in, what do they get? Do they get the results they're looking for? Or do they keep trying? They have to maybe type in five different variations uh, to see what they're looking for. If your customers have to type in five different variations, uh, you are probably going to lose because your competitors will do a better job. And uh, you know, I think the uh, uh, another lesson is that uh, you your customers are not comparing your experience, your customer experience, to uh, your competitors. Okay, you think, well, gee, uh, I'm better than my competitors at this uh, because man, their their user experience is really terrible, or their customer experience is awful. Uh, they are comparing you to the best customer experience they get. So they are comparing you to Amazon. They're comparing you to Uber. And if you aren't doing that, uh, then they're saying, yeah, this was kind of high effort, uh, not very good. Yeah. And uh, Roger, I have seen a few startups. They actually say they don't have competitors at all. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, some guys, they say. But actually, uh, I noticed that um, they are competing against the decision of, of the user to not doing anything. So is there friction on this decision of actually taking an action or not doing anything? How does it work? Well, okay. Uh, the, the answer, of course, Gustavo, is yes, because um, now, as our Nobel Prize winner Richard Thaler said, never underestimate the power of inertia. People will naturally prefer to do nothing. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for 
uh, discovering, among other things, that more people would uh, participate in retirement plans, which is a desirable goal for society. Uh, you want people to uh, save for retirement because if they don't save for retirement, then when they uh, do retire, maybe they'll run out of money, uh, the state will have to support them or they'll be starving or something. So uh, it's a good thing uh, for them to save, but a lot of people don't do it because as we know, human nature is such that uh, thinking about a benefit uh, 30 or 40 years in the future doesn't seem nearly as important as thinking about a benefit that you can experience right now or today or this week. So we spend money on stuff instead of saving. But uh, uh, his research found that uh, simply by making people, uh, instead of making people opt in to their retirement plan by filling out a form or something, if you made them opt out, in other words, you opted them in automatically and to not participate, they had to fill out the form, many more people stayed in the plan. So uh, simply by having them do nothing to be in the plan, uh, that improved results tremendously. And so uh, if you are a startup or business and the alternative to using your product is to do nothing, people will probably do nothing. Uh, and I, I'm always suspicious of a company that says they have no competition because if there's no competition, uh, quite possibly there's no market. Now that isn't always true. Certainly people do discover new markets, but uh, when uh, there's a market that isn't being served by somebody, uh, you really have to question whether uh, that market need exists. And, uh, but you know, if you are going for that, then what you have to do is ensure that uh, to use your product or service, uh, there is minimal effort expended. So make it as easy as possible to get started, as easy as possible to use, because your competition is doing nothing at all. So uh, if you give people something that is effortful to do, if it's confusing or difficult, or if they have to make a lot of decisions, uh, then they probably won't do it. So Roger, uh, can you give a few tips for the entrepreneurs uh, to to spot um, friction, maybe uh, they won't be able to buy the goggles on Amazon, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure there must be some some things they can do to refine your vision and then be more um, alert when when you, when you see friction. Right. Well, yeah. Actually, uh, what I say is when people. Um, read the book, Friction, uh, that they will get those goggles, uh, metaphorically, not physical goggles, but uh, they will start seeing more friction. And I know that uh, even when I do a speech uh, for 45 minutes or 50 minutes, uh, afterwards people come up to me and say, wow, now I'm seeing friction everywhere. Or even uh, if I see them weeks later, months later, I say, wow, ever since I read the book or I listened to your talk, uh, I'm seeing more friction. So uh, that is how you get those friction goggles is by um, uh, just uh, thinking about it and studying it and uh, looking for it. The uh, I do have a few tips. First of all, when you uh, are exposed to friction, just as we have done here in this little conversation, uh, we have changed our uh, listeners and viewers' brains a little bit. Uh, our brains have something called the reticular activating system. Uh, and what this is, it's a filter in our brain that screens out everything that isn't important. Uh, and our brains uh, need that kind of a system. Imagine trying to cross uh, a busy intersection in a large city. Uh, if you had to be paying attention to uh, all the people and signs and uh, billboards and cars and going in every direction, uh, you would never be able to cross the street. It'd be uh, too much input, you couldn't decide. So your RAS screens out everything except uh, oncoming cars, the crosswalk indicator, and the pedestrians right around you. And so you can cross the street safely. And uh, probably uh, people listening have had their own RAS experience. Uh, if they've ever purchased a new car uh, and they thought their car was pretty unique, and suddenly after that, they start seeing cars that look like theirs everywhere. It's like, wow, that one's like mine, that one's like mine. Uh, where did all these look-alike cars come from? Those look-alike cars were always there it's just that now, because that's your car, your RAS is saying, well, that might be important. Uh, I, I better let that through. And once you start looking for friction and seeing it, 
uh, your RAS becomes more sensitized to seeing it again and again. So in that way, we've, we've changed everybody's brains uh, just in this short session. Now, as far as w how to look for it or how to find it, uh, I think the single most valuable thing is what I alluded to before, and that is observing your customers who are actually using it. Uh, because uh, your uh, design people, you, if it's an app, your app design people or a website, uh, uh, they know how to use it. You know how to use it because you've been testing it all along. Uh, probably most of the people in your company know how to use it. What you want to do is give it to somebody who is totally unfamiliar with it and preferably a little bit clueless. Uh, you know, give it to uh, your mother or something uh, if she's not if she's not a Google engineer, uh, and say, okay, mom, uh, I want you to uh, get a ride using this app, and don't don't explain it to her, and see if she can figure it out uh, on her own. Uh, and that's how you will find. Huh? I thought that was obvious, but apparently it's not obvious to somebody who is not familiar with it. So uh, by uh, uh, watching real users and preferably sort of naive or inexperienced users, uh, you will see where people are getting slowed down and where you can eliminate those little bits of friction until uh, it's uh, effortless for anybody of any skill level. And so uh, that's the first thing. And there are you know, multiple ways to do that. You can use uh, physical observation. You can, uh, there are services that will uh, give you videos of people who are using your app or your website. Uh, you can do laboratory testing, actually sort of set up a user testing lab. Uh, not everybody has the resource to do that, uh, or you can have outsource that. Uh, but you can also use many of the digital tools out there. There are things like eye tracking, click tracking, uh, scroll tracking, all these things that will tell you uh, how your users are behaving uh, on your app or on your website. Uh, and you can find those bottlenecks. If you look at click tracking, uh, I am almost certain that you will find that people are trying to click on stuff that is not clickable, uh, but they think it might be, so they're trying it. Uh, maybe because it's confusing, uh, because it looks like a button, even though it isn't. Uh, and you may find, too, that your the thing you want them to click on uh, isn't as obvious uh, as you would think. So. Uh, that's that's just one tool. Eye tracking tells you where people are looking. Are they looking at the key points? Uh, if not, uh, then you probably need to redesign everything. Uh, and you know, by repetitively going through this, and a lot of these tools are really quite inexpensive today. It used to be that uh, these tools were costly, but just about anybody can afford them. Uh, and uh, that will eliminate uh, all these hidden friction points. We, we talked about search before. Just even you know, a free WordPress plugin will tell you what people are searching for on your website. Uh, make a list of that and look and see, are they uh, finding it? Uh, are they rewording it? Are they uh, having to scroll past page one of the results to see what they're looking for? Uh, conduct that search yourself. Say, okay, well, I think I see what they're looking for. Conduct that search yourself on your website or your app and see if you get what you're expecting. You may find that, huh, wow, only one of those five items is actually relevant uh, because you need to uh, improve your algorithm, much like the example I gave with Lowe's. Uh, I searched for a very specific four-word search term. There's no reason why every result shouldn't have been exactly what I searched for, but uh, their algorithm was wrong. It uh, gave me results that were not relevant. So, uh, you know, I think that all of these tools are very accessible uh, and often quite inexpensive, but they can eliminate this and really set you apart from your competition. Roger Dooley, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy this interview with me. And uh, where can people learn more about your work? And of course, uh, part of buying your books, uh, where can people uh, learn more about your work with uh, neuroscience? Right, well, my, um, uh, my main site uh, that's a jumping off point to uh, my various content uh, is rogerdooley.com. Uh, so that's pretty easy. And you can reach my Forbes blog, my neuromarketing blog from there, and my podcast too, uh, and also my books. Uh, the books are available at Amazon and other booksellers, of course. Uh, and on social media, I'm pretty accessible. I'm on LinkedIn, and I am on Twitter and Instagram. On the latter two, I am at Roger Dooley. 
Nice. Roger is the host of uh, Brainfluence podcast, which I highly recommend. So thanks again, Roger. Uh, and if you are struggling to design and launch a multi-sided platform, please subscribe to my channel and visit startupspace.io. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gustavo.